All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion about functions, and we're going to specifically take a closer look at overloading and pass by reference. We'll also review what we learned in our previous video, take a look at more examples, and also review best practices for working with functions. Okay, so here's our goals for today's video. We'll first review function declarations, definitions, and calls in C++. Once we're done reviewing, we'll take a look at best practices for writing functions. We'll also cover the differences between local and global variables and why we need to pay attention to that for our purposes. We'll also take a look at overloaded functions and pass by reference and know how and when to use both of these tools. Finally, at the end, we will talk about debugging and we'll also go through another example that puts all of these tools together. So let's go ahead and start out with a review from our previous video. So you'll remember that we introduced the idea of using functions in C++. We learned that these functions are kind of similar to the ones we worked with in math class. In C++, a function is a collection of statements that will perform a certain task. The inputs that we send into our functions are called arguments. And we learned that functions can have any number of arguments, you can have zero arguments or many arguments. We also learned that functions can help make our life easier. If we use functions in a clever way, we can end up simplifying our programming process. We can have fewer lines of code to debug and we can make our programs more easy to maintain and change because we only need to update code in a function rather than throughout our entire program. So let's briefly review the three main steps that we need to follow when using functions in C++. Here's our three main steps. The first thing we need to do when using functions in C++ is we need to declare our function. This is also known as making a function prototype. Next, we need to define the function. The function definition is where we put the code the function does. So the function definition is what actually tells the function what to do when we call it. Finally, our last step is to call the function. And in order to do that, we use the specific syntax and that will make our function execute. Let's briefly review the syntax and procedures for each of these steps. First, we need to declare our functions. And you'll remember that this is very similar to declaring a variable. A function declaration tells the compiler that our function exists. And as long as we include this declaration and the function definition, we will be able to call our function at any point after the declaration appears. And notice the declaration includes many important bits of information about our function. So it includes return type. We've got the name of our function, the function's arguments, and notice we do put a semicolon after the end of our declaration. We also covered an important practice for this class. You'll remember I mentioned in our previous video 
that whenever you are writing a function declaration, you must include comments. Specifically, we must include a precondition and a postcondition. Remember, the precondition tells us what initial conditions are required for the function to run. Preconditions are especially important if your function requires other values to be declared and defined. For example, if add together used other functions in order to run, we would want to let our user know that we would also require certain other functions to be declared and defined, or maybe we need certain constants to be declared and defined, so we need to put all the required initial conditions in our precondition comment. In this example for add together, we require that first number and second number are initialized. So that means the arguments we plug in need to be initialized to a valid double type bit of data. Similarly, the post condition will tell us what happens after the function has completed. So that tells us So one important point about the post condition is the post condition tells us what happens after the function has run. But notice it does not tell us how the function gets the result. It simply tells us what has happened after the function completes. So in this case for add together, we are told the post condition is that we returned the sum of first number and second number. It doesn't tell us how we calculated that sum, but it tells us what the end result of that function will be. The reason why we want to include these precondition and postcondition comments is so that it's very clear what each function in our program does. So once again, make sure you always include precondition and postcondition comments with every function declaration that you write. This is really important to make sure that it's very clear what each function in your program does. Next, after we have declared our function, we need to make sure we have defined our functions. And you'll remember that in a function definition, we include all the code that the function needs to do when it is called. So the definition describes how a function does its tasks. And you'll notice the definition has a header which matches the declaration. And inside the curly braces, we put the code that that function should run. And so you'll notice in this case, this function add together is supposed to return a double type value. And we'll remember it's actually supposed to add together first number and second number. So we see in the definition, we can actually write this function with just one line of code. We can have this function return the sum of the two arguments. Of course, please remember that the function definition will often be much longer than a single line of code. So you do not have to try to fit your whole function definition into a return statement often you're going to need multiple lines of code in order to write your function definition. And remember, if you're working with a void type function that has no return type, then the void type function will not need a return statement. Other things to remember, the function definition can appear before or after the function is called. But in our class, we will put the function definitions 
after the main function, and we put our function declarations before the main function. That way our functions can be used at any point after they are declared. Finally, be careful of syntax. The function definition is very similar to the declaration, except there is no semicolon after the parentheses on the function definition header. All right, so once we have declared and defined our function, then we are ready to call the function. When we call a function, that is when we cause the function to execute. We give the function any required arguments and the function will execute the code inside the definition. So if we wanted to call the function add together, we would use syntax like this. We take the function's name, followed by parentheses, we plug in the arguments we want to use, and we put a semicolon at the end. When we call the function, the program will execute the code inside the function definition. And once the call is complete, the program will resume wherever we left off after the function had been called. So let's go ahead and do a quick review question to practice these topics. So let's consider this example. We have our function add together, and then we also have another function called is equal, which we have declared. In this review question, we're first asked to identify the declaration, definition, and call for add together. We are then asked to write a definition for the isEqual function. So if you'd like, go ahead and pause this video and give this a try. So let's go ahead and walk through this question. First, we want to identify the declaration. Remember, the declaration always goes before the main function. So here are our function declarations. We've put them at the top of our program right before our main function. That way, these functions will be available to be used at any point after the declaration. We can also tell that the declarations are declarations based on the precondition, postcondition comments and the fact that we're ending with a semicolon. Next is the function definition. And we know the function definitions should appear after the main function. So the definition of our add together function is located just after the main function. Finally, the call for our add together function is when we actually have add together execute. And we see that our function call is located inside our main function. So we've completed the first part. Let's go ahead and do the next part. Now we want to write a function definition for the isEqual function. So where should we write the function definition? Well, if you remember, the function definition should be written after the main function. And we were already given our declaration and comments telling us what this function should do. So based on the declaration, 
we know that is equal should return true if the two arguments are equal. Otherwise, we return false. So based on this information, we have everything we need to know to write the definition. We can go ahead and write our definition right underneath our definition for add together. So in this case, our is equal function, the definition needs to match the information in the declaration. And then we put the code inside the curly braces. There's a few different ways we could write the definition for this is equal function. One way is to use if statements. So here in this example, notice I could write an if statement that if my first number and second number are the same, I return true. If that if statement doesn't trigger, then I will return false because the values are not equal. This is a perfectly acceptable way of writing the is equal function. More experienced programmers would actually write this a slightly different way. So it turns out we can actually write this function definition with just a single line of code. More experienced programmers will write the is equal function like this. We know first number double equal second number, this will return a true or a false. So we can say, well, if first number double equals second number, it will be true if the values are the same, otherwise false. Otherwise, using the if statements is also acceptable, but it just requires a bit extra code. All right, so based on this example, you can see how important it is to have very clear preconditions and postconditions. That way it's very easy to tell what each function is supposed to do. And if you were to be writing a bunch of functions with a team, it would be easier to follow what each function needs to complete. So if you have any questions on these functions, please do feel free to reach out. And if you're rusty, I would also encourage you to look at our previous video for more examples on functions. Let's go ahead and continue on to procedural abstraction and more about best practices when using functions. So often you'll see this term, procedural abstraction, when you're talking about and learning about functions. This term sounds kind of big and fancy, but basically, when we say procedure here, what we mean is writing a function-like set of instructions. And abstraction implies that you're basically abstracting away the details of how that function works. So when we say procedural abstraction, what we mean is that we are writing and using functions as if they were black boxes. You may have heard the term black box before. A black box is something where we know the inputs and outputs. So we know the input, we know the expected output, but we don't know the details of how the process happens to convert inputs to outputs. So once again, when we say we are using procedural abstraction, we are basically treating our functions as black boxes, where we know what the inputs and outputs will be, but 
the details about how that function works, that could be hidden away. As shown in this example, suppose we had a plus two function. If our input was one, we would know if plus two adds two to any number, our output must be three. We don't necessarily know how that addition is completed, but we know that every time we use that function, we will add two to get our output. So we will often see if you're working with larger teams to write programs, or if you are writing a more complex program, often this procedural abstraction process can be a very useful and powerful tool, both for planning and implementing functions and programs. So this idea of using functions like black boxes that brings us to some best practices. There are certain general rules and procedures that you'll want to follow when writing functions in your programs. Let's go ahead and go through seven best practices when working with functions in C++. Our first best practice comes straight from that idea of procedural abstraction. We want to write our functions so that the declaration and comments provides everything a programmer needs to know in order to use that function. So notice in this example with factorial, we can immediately tell from the function declaration and comments, we see that the factorial function will return the value of n factorial, and our input n must be initialized as an int variable and must be a non-negative value. By writing our functions in this way, any programmer would be able to pick up and use the function that we have written without needing to dig into the details of the function definition. So often in industry, you might be sharing code with different teammates, and you'll need to be able to pick up and use other people's code quickly and easily. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of doing this. Write functions so that declaration and comments provides everything a programmer needs to know if they wanted to use that function. Next best practice, design your functions as self-contained modules. This is really important. When we say self-contained, what we mean is that we want functions to be able to run independently without relying on other portions of your program to have completed. If the functions are dependent on some other part of your program being run, then that should definitely be captured in the preconditions and postconditions. But you also want to make sure that the functions themselves contain all the information they need in order to complete their task. Our next best practice is to give your functions and their parameters meaningful names. So we wouldn't want to just call our function, function one. Notice this first example, if we were to name our function, function one, that's not a descriptive name, value one, value two. That doesn't tell us a lot about what that function does. In contrast, look at function number two. If we have a function named find max value with two arguments named val to compare one, val to compare two, Notice that name is very descriptive and it's easy to determine. What the function does. You know, find max value that implies that if we're comparing two values, this find max value function is going to give us the larger of the two values we still need to write the code in the definition 
to complete that task, but the name of the function makes it very clear to other programmers what we're trying to do. Next good practice is the camel case naming convention. So C++ generally uses this naming convention where we start function and variable names with lowercase letters. And if we have multiple words, we combine them together without spaces and punctuation. But notice if multiple words are combined together, we capitalize the first letter of the next word. So for example, find max value becomes, in camel case, find max value with capitalized on the first letter of the next word. So this is a very common practice and it's called camel case because the, the capitalization makes little bumps in the name, kind of like the humps on a camel's back. One thing to note is that some programmers and textbooks will capitalize the name of functions. It's just a different style, but for our purposes, we'll usually be following camel case. Either approach is technically correct, but camel case is very commonly used. Good practice number five, use pseudocode to help explain your code in your comments. Pseudocode is a mixture of C++ and English, and often by using a mixture of C++ and English language, we can better describe what we are trying to do in our comments. Here's our sixth best practice. Use decomposition when writing programs. This is an interesting one. Up until this point in the course, we have been writing most of our code inside the main function. And that is a valid approach for programming. But in the real world, the main function usually contains very little code. Generally, the main function will call other functions that complete the program's key tasks. So for example, in this program shown here, we see that our main function actually only contains four, four statements inside main. We declare variables and then we're calling functions. So we'll jump over to these other functions get data files and process grade file. So the main function itself is delegating tasks to other functions that we've written. This process is called decomposition. So in decomposition, what we do is instead of writing all our code in the main function, we write separate functions for each of our programs main tasks. You might be wondering, well, how does this help? One of the biggest ways this helps us is that we can debug and test these functions individually, one at a time. We can verify that each of these smaller functions works before putting all the functions back together in our final program. Another advantage of this approach is that if the function is used multiple times throughout our program, we only need to change the code in that function in order to change the task everywhere where that function is used. So it makes our programs a lot easier to write and debug and modify as needed. So as we're going through our example programs in these videos and in future videos, keep decomposition in mind. And when possible, 
try to design and plan your programs so that you can use decomposition. You'll often find if you debug and test functions one at a time, it will actually be faster and easier to complete your programs. Our last best practice involves global variables. In this introductory C++ course, I will require that you avoid using global variables. In more advanced courses, you may learn about certain appropriate times when we would choose to use a global variable. In our class, we are only going to use global constants, which are fixed values that do not change. So when we say a global variable, what we mean is a global variable is a variable declared outside all the functions in our program. What that means is that global variables are accessible by any function in our program after that global variable was declared. The problem with global variables is that if we're not careful, any function can change and modify those global variables, and it can easily create bugs and problems in our program. So for our purposes, we generally avoid using global variables, and instead we use what we call local variables. Local variables are variables which are declared inside a function. What that means you may remember is that those variables only exist inside the function where they are declared. Most of the time, for what we're doing, local variables are sufficient for our needs. And another important thing to note about local variables is that local variables exist only while the function is executing. The time that a variable exists is known as its lifetime. So once a function has stopped executing, any variables inside that function will be deleted from memory and they will no longer exist. So once again, just a reminder, please avoid using global variables in this class. On assignments, I will deduct points if I see that you are using global variables when you should be using local ones. And if you take more advanced C++ courses, you may learn about certain situations when global variables can and should be used, but that's, that specific situation is beyond the scope of our course. Let's look at a quick example of a global variable so that you can see what some of the risks of using global variables are. Remember, global variables are variables that are declared outside all of our functions. So in this example code, we see that we have declared num. And this declaration is outside all of our functions. What that means is that any function that comes after this declaration, any function can access and change that value num. And for what we're doing in our class, we generally don't want any function to be able to just walk in and change our data. And so in this case, what we'll see is that if we run these different functions, our main function and this function called another function, both of these functions can change num. And the value of num can be constantly changing and creating a lot of confusion in this program. Let's go ahead and run this in CLion so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so here is our program that we were just looking at. And you see, we have declared that global variable num. 
and we have assigned it the value 1. So let's go ahead and run this program, and you can see kind of what's happening here. And notice that these functions have now triggered, and we see that in our main function, our value num is originally 1, then we decided to call another function. Another function now triggered. And we're saying, OK, since num is global, num is still equal to 1 in another function. But then in another function, we decided to change our value num to 20 while we were in another function. So in another function, our value num became 20. But now if we go back to our main function, we see that after another function has finished, our value num is still 20. So basically, any function can go in and change that variable num. And if we're not careful, that can create some serious bugs in our program. So if you were to attempt something like this on an assignment, you would lose points because you, are, you should not be using global variables. Instead, you should be declaring variables inside functions. For example, here you could declare the variable num inside main. But notice, once I declare num inside main, it only exists within main, and now the other function cannot access that value. So once again, for our purposes, please make sure that you declare variables only inside functions. We should not be using global variables in this class. The challenge with global variables is that any function can modify or change them, making it very easy to create bugs and cause problems in our programs. All right, so let's go ahead and do a quick question before we move on. See if you can identify the statement which is false. Take a moment and pause the video if you'd like. All right, so what did you come up with? Let's go through line by line. First statement, variables declared inside a function are local to that function. This statement is true. If a variable is declared inside the function that is considered to be a local variable, Next one, variables declared within the main function are said to be local to the main function. This is also true. How about choice C? A function's local variables exist only while the function is executing. That is also true. Remember, we talked about how a variable only exists inside the function where it was declared. And so once that function has stopped executing, those local variables will no longer exist. So the false statement is choice D. If I declare a variable inside one function, other functions will not be able to access that variable. So it's very important to have control over who has access to our variables. And so in this case, if we declare a variable inside one function, other functions cannot access or change that variable. So just a reminder, please avoid using global variables in our course. They can make programs difficult to debug, and generally they're only used for really advanced programming features that 
are beyond the scope of our class. You could see how they may be good for communicating status across many functions and more complex features that you'll learn about in future classes. So please make sure you use only local variables for our course and be aware that I will deduct points if I see you using global variables when you should be using local ones. In our class, we will be using something else called global constants, which we'll cover a bit more when we discuss arrays. All right, so let's go ahead and summarize our best practices. Please make sure you try to follow these best practices whenever you're using functions in your programs. Remember to write your functions so that the declaration and precondition postcondition comments provide everything a programmer needs to know in order to use that function. Also remember to design your functions as self-contained modules so that they can complete their tasks without relying on information from other places. Also give your functions and parameters meaningful names. Just like variables, you want to try to use self-commenting names so it's easy to tell what the functions are supposed to do. Also use pseudocode to help explain your code and your comments. Use decomposition when writing programs. Remember, instead of writing all your code in the main function, you can write separate functions to complete the major tasks of your program. This will make your programs easier to code, change, and debug. And finally, for our class, please avoid using global variables. Let's now move on to our next topic, overloading. So when you hear the word overload, you might be thinking of overloading somebody with too much work or something scary like that. Here, when we talk about overloading functions, it's actually not nearly that scary. Overloading a function name means providing more than one declaration and definition for a function using the same name. So an example of this is for a situation where the same function name could need to process different numbers or types of arguments. For example, what if you had an average function, which you needed to be able to average either two or three arguments? You could have average that only takes two arguments and so on. We'll learn later in the course about specific situations when overloading is useful. For now, please remember that the purpose of overloading is when you need to have more than one declaration and definition for a function which has the same name. In this case, for this example, both functions are named average, but there are two different versions of average. Let's look at another example of overloading. So in this example, we have two versions of a function called square. So notice that we have one version of a function square that takes an int argument and it will return an int type value. The second version of our square function will return a double type variable and it takes a double type argument. You could see how this might be useful in situations where we wanted to avoid truncation errors or other issues. 
So notice that both versions of square have their own declaration and their own definition. So notice the int version of square still returns number times number. Double version also has its own definition. So if you're overloading a function, you need to include a separate declaration and definition for each version of the function. So here, since we have two versions of square, we have two declarations and two definitions. And you might be wondering, well, how would the compiler know which one to use? Because notice when we call square, we just use the name square and an argument. The compiler determines which version to use based on the number and type of input arguments. So notice if we give it an int type argument, we will use the int version of square. If we give square a double type argument, then we will use the double version of square. So the versions need to have unique number and type of inputs so the compiler can determine which unique version to use. Let's briefly run this program so you can see it in action. All right, so if I run overloading, notice what I get. I'm asked to enter an integer and a decimal number and press enter. So maybe my integer is four and my decimal number is 1.5. I press enter and notice it tells me that the square of 4 is 16 and the square of 1.5 is 2.25. And so notice it recognizes which version of the function to call. And if I put a breakpoint and run the debugger, you'll see we can actually watch and the compiler will go to the correct version of the function. So here, if we track our variables, we see if we step into this line of code, we see that for the first function, we recognize that we gave an int input. And so notice our program went into the int version of square to give us our calculation. So when would we actually use this? We will learn about certain situations when overloading is very useful. In general, overloading is used to create functions that perform the same task and have the same name. If those functions take different types and different numbers of parameters or input arguments. Remember, we generally want to avoid using overloading unless it really actually helps us. Because when we're doing overloading, we have to write an extra definition and declaration for each version of that function. So unless the overloading is giving you some important advantage, then you might find it more convenient to just write separate functions. So overloading does not necessarily save you all that much time, but there are certain situations we'll learn about later where overloading is very important and very much needed for certain types of situations. And notice this very last point. 
the compiler will determine which version of the function to call based on the number of arguments we give and the data type of the arguments. So the number of arguments and the data type of those arguments, it must be unique for each overloaded version of that function. If two versions of an overloaded function take the same number and the same type of arguments, the compiler won't know which version of that function to use. So let's go ahead and move on to our last topic, which is call by reference, also known as pass by reference. So you might remember in our previous video, we covered call by value, also known as pass by value. And we learned that so far the values we plug into our function, into our formal parameters, the values we plug in are just the values. They're copies of the actual variable. So any changes made to the parameter in our function, that will not affect the original variables that we had plugged in. We're just plugging in copies of our variable into a function. In call by value, we plug in our values in the order they're received. And you remember the values are plugged in for all instances of that parameter in our function. So basically, if we use call by value or pass by value, We are plugging in copies. We are plugging in copies of a variable to our function. And the function can't change. Function can't change the original variable. whose copy was plugged in. So what we're saying is we're just giving our functions a copy of our original variable, and that protects our original variable from being changed by the function. But sometimes there are situations where we want our functions to actually change the values of our original variables. Sometimes we want functions to be able to update stuff back in our main function and have those updates actually stay permanent. So to do that, we can use a different approach called pass by reference or call by reference. So in this approach, we're actually giving function's permission to modify variables directly in their memory. So rather than chain rather than using a copy of a variable we actually give the function the memory address where that variable is stored, and the function can go ahead and change the actual input variables. So call by reference, also known as pass by reference, it allows our function to modify the original arguments plugged into the function. It's not just given a copy. So what this does is this allows our function to modify the arguments we plug in, and the changes will persist even after the function has ended. Those changes are made directly in memory, so since the changes are made 
at the memory address where the variable is located. So the changes are preserved. Are preserved after the function ends. And interestingly, we'll see in a moment that pass by reference or call by reference provides a workaround which allows functions to return more than one value. We can use pass by reference to allow a function to change multiple arguments, and those changes could be made directly in the memory. So this allows one function to modify or effectively return more than one value. Let's talk about how this works and do some examples to illustrate. So first, let's look at how we would actually use call by reference or pass by reference. What we do is we include an ampersand next to the name of the variable in the function declaration. And we also include an ampersand next to the variable's name in the function definition. So the ampersand is called the reference operator. And this operator will actually return the memory address of a variable. So when we're using pass by reference, we are actually plugging in the memory address where that variable is stored. So we're actually telling the function don't just change a copy, go to the actual memory address where the variable is stored. And then this way, any changes made will actually change the variable's value. in the memory. So notice this is different than just plugging in a copy of our variable. We're actually telling the function, okay, you have permission to go to this memory address and change the value stored there. And again, since the declaration and definition must match, the definition also receives that memory address. Notice, however, that you do not include that ampersand when calling the function. So if you were to call the function, you, you do not put an ampersand next to the value of the argument when calling. Also, one other thing to note is the space between the data type and the ampersand is not important. So you can write int ampersand, or some people will write int So either of those approaches is acceptable. Remember the ampersand is basically allowing us to give the function a memory address where the variable is stored, rather than just a copy. So other than making these changes with the ampersand, using functions with pass by reference is the same exact procedure as we learned with pass by value. We still use the declaration, definition, and call. The only difference is we have to have that ampersand next to any argument that should be passed by reference. Let's look at a quick example of pass by reference. So here in this example, you can see we have our declaration. And we're declaring this function called double num. 
and this function is supposed to double the value of the input argument ref var. And notice we have that ampersand there so that we pass in the memory address where ref var is stored. Similarly, in the definition, we also have the same syntax for the function with the ampersand there. And notice, otherwise, we write the definition the same way we would with pass by value. We're simply going to double the value of the input argument. And then finally, when we want to call our function, we use the same approach as before. We just take the function name, put the argument in parentheses, and end with a semicolon. Let's briefly demonstrate this in CLion so you can see the difference between pass by value and pass by reference. So here's our example code, and you can see we have our variable ref var with the ampersand to make it a reference variable. And we have also included that ampersand in our definition. Let's go ahead and run this program. And so if we run it, if we enter a number we want to double, say number 10. We see in our main function our number is originally 10. We call double num. And now in our main function, the value of number is now 20. So double num was able to go in and modify the value num that we gave it and double the value. Suppose instead we wanted to use pass by value. Suppose we deleted those ampersands. If we do not have these ampersands, then instead of plugging in the memory address, we're just plugging in a copy. And we will see without those ampersands, the number 10 will not be doubled. Without the ampersands, in main function, our number is 10. We pass 10 into a double num and we double it, but we're just plugging in a copy. So any changes made inside double num only exist here. And we see that our number did not double. So in order for pass by reference to work, we have to have that ampersand next to the input arguments which we want to pass by reference. When we include that ampersand, we are allowing our function to go directly to the memory where the input argument is stored. That way, any changes made to this memory address where a number is stored, those changes will still exist even after double num finishes. So once again, if we put those ampersands back in, we see that any changes made by the function to the argument are preserved because a function was given permission to modify the actual value of my input argument in the memory. So pass by reference is a really important tool that we'll use whenever we want to give our functions permission to modify the variables we plug in. So here's a few reminders just to keep in mind when using pass by reference. Remember that every parameter or every argument that you want to use pass by reference you must put that ampersand in both the declaration and definition. Otherwise, that argument will be treated as passed by value and a copy will be plugged in rather than the actual memory address. Also, the space between the data type and the ampersand is unimportant. So as we mentioned, you can have a space there, that's okay.
Remember, the ampersand has to be in both definition and declaration, and it designates the variable or parameter as a reference variable. Also note that any argument using pass by reference, it must be a variable. You can't use a constant or an expression as a reference. It has to be an actual variable being stored at a given memory address. So you might be wondering, well, how do we decide when to just plug in a copy of our variable versus use pass by reference to plug in and give permission for the function to change the argument? How would we decide when to use pass by reference instead of plugging in just a copy? Here are three questions that will help you determine whether you need pass by reference. First question, do you need the function to have permission to change the value of the variable used as an argument? So if the function needs to change the variable that you plug in, do you want that change to exist even after the function ends? Then you would use pass by reference. Also, is the, is the value you are passing into your function very large? Programs we've written so, so far have just used ints and doubles and relatively small sets of data. But if you need to plug terabytes of data into a function, you might not want to have to copy that. So rather than plugging in a copy of a really big set of data, you might find it more convenient instead to use pass by reference. That way you don't have to make a copy of a really big data value. Also, do you want to allow your function to modify several variables which were declared in main or elsewhere? If you want your function to be able to modify several variables and essentially return more than one thing, then you'd want to use call by reference or pass by reference. If the answers to all three of these questions are no, then call by value or pass by value is sufficient. Then you can just plug in a copy of the variable. Remember, if you do not include the ampersand in the function declaration and definition, we default to pass by value. Let's take a look at some situations where pass by reference would be potentially useful. Here's one example. Later on in the course, we're going to talk about sorting algorithms. And in certain situations, it is convenient to be able to swap the values stored in variables. For example, maybe you have two variables, variable one, variable two. And maybe you want to swap the values stored in those variables. So for example, What if you wanted to do this, where you interchange the values that were stored in those two variables? Pass by reference would allow you to do this. So what you would need to do is you need to include that ampersand to designate both variables as pass by reference variables. And then you could write a swap values function similar to the one shown here. Notice that you're actually also required to create a temp variable as well, because that ensures that nobody gets overwritten. For example, here, if I had variable one is five and variable two is 10, notice what would happen. 
I would initially say temp is variable one. Then I would set variable one equal to variable two. So now variable one holds 10. And then because I still have variable one stored in temp, I can say variable two equals temp. And notice this allows that swap to be successfully performed. And because these changes are made to a pass by reference variable, these changes will be made directly in the memory where those variables are stored. Let's look at another example of where pass by reference might be used. Remember that we said that functions normally can only return one value. But what if I wanted to write a function that could return more than one value? Here is an example of how pass by reference would allow me to return more than one value in my functions. So in this example, I've written a function called get scores. And this get scores function should prompt the user for some scores and give them back to the values in my main function. So in this case, my get scores function is supposed to update homework score, midterm score, and final score in my main function. So notice what we do. We use pass by reference for each of these inputs. Then when I prompt the user to give me a value for the variable homework, notice that value is going to be updating my reference variable and changes made will be directly saved in the original variable's memory. Same for midterm and for final. So notice by using pass by reference, this get scores function is able to update three variables located in main. So this is a really powerful workaround that allows one function to effectively return more than one value because that function has permission to update the three reference variables in its argument. So if you're ever in a situation where you want your function to return more than one thing, pass by reference could be a very useful workaround. One other thing to note, I did not show the declaration of get scores on this slide, but notice that you would need to also include the declaration with those ampersands in order for this program to run. All right, let's move on to our next function topic. It's important to know that we are not only allowed to have the main function call functions. It turns out that Functions can also call other functions, and functions can even call themselves in a process called recursion. Let's look at an example of a function calling another function. So if we return to that example we saw earlier, you'll see we have this get scores function that is prompting the user for a homework midterm and final exam score. And this function is calling a second function called check valid input. And this check valid input function will ensure that the score provided by the user is a valid number between 0 and 200. So 
Notice this is a nice way to ensure that whatever inputs given by the user, we want to make sure that those inputs are valid. And so in this case, this check valid input function, this would make sure that we are indeed using a valid number in our program. It's a good way of making sure our user doesn't give us bad data. All right, so before we wrap up with our example, let's cover just a few more points about debugging techniques and ways that functions can help make our life easier as a programmer. Here are some general debugging techniques that work very well. We've hinted at some of these in our prior videos as well. Our first debugging technique, which is extremely powerful, is to use breakpoints and the debugger. Most IDEs have the capability of placing breakpoints in your program. Breakpoints allow you to pause your program at a specified point, and these allow you to check the values of variables and see what's going on during your program. If you take a look at some of our earlier videos, such as the data types video, you'll see several demos of this debugger in action. So the debugger is also really powerful because we can actually pause our program at the breakpoint and run our program line by line while inspecting variables. We saw in our data types lecture that this allowed us to help pinpoint errors caused by bugs or other issues in our code. Another way that you can check for errors is you could also place cout statements at various points in your program to see what the values stored in variables are. Another thing you can do to make debugging easier is test functions one at a time. So rather than sitting down and writing your entire program at once, write and test each function one by one. Once you verify that each function works, then you can move on to the next function. That brings us to our next debugging technique. Develop your code incrementally. Rather than waiting till the end in order to test your code, verify that each smaller section works before moving on to the next part. This can make your code a lot easier to debug later on as it gets more complex. Also, it's very important to start programs and assignments early so that you have time to revisit with fresh eyes. If you've been stuck on a program for a while and you haven't made progress, it would be a good opportunity to take a short break and revisit the program even a few minutes later, or if not a few hours later, after having a break. And often you'll find that if you look at a program with fresh eyes, you might notice some bugs or issues which you had not noticed before. Also, it's very important to take advantage of other ways to get help, such as your instructor's help hours, class discord page, and campus tutoring. It's a fact of life that programmers will run into bugs, and it can make programming incredibly frustrating at times. But generally, by struggling with bugs, you'll find that you'll learn so much as you program and continue to improve. So one of the best ways to learn is by understanding why you ran into bugs and how you can fix them. And you'll find that as you gain more and more experience debugging and testing programs, you'll understand how C++ works better and better. So please don't hesitate to reach out for help and really take advantage of these opportunities to learn the debugger, 
test code one function at a time, and implement these debugging techniques. These are really powerful tools that will help a lot. Just to recap, one of my favorite ways to debug is to ultimately prevent bugs in the first place. And so I can't emphasize enough how helpful it can be to develop your program incrementally. So especially as our assignments in this class get more complex, think about your algorithm and the process your program needs to follow. Rather than trying to write your program all at once, Work on it a little bit at a time. Write a little bit of code and then test it. See if it works. And use the milestones and the hints provided in our assignments to help you make progress. Initially, going step by step might feel slower. It's really tempting to just try to write everything start to finish. But it's actually a lot more efficient to go step by step and verify that each piece works than it is to rush through and be stuck with some really nasty bugs at the end and not know why your bugs are happening. Also, make sure you verify each section of code works before moving on. Another thing you can do is comment out your function completely and move on to a different function if you're not sure why it's not working. Sometimes by isolating the part that's not working, you can figure out whether the other portions are working and better pinpoint the error. And so compiling and running your code very often so you can see what works and what doesn't work, that can give you a lot of great information. And finally, remember, you can always take advantage of office hours, Discord, email, and other ways to get help from your instructor and campus tutoring. One other item that's good to mention when talking about functions are these things called stubs and drivers. These are often used when you're writing very complex programs that can't be finished in a single day, or when you're working with a larger team on a more complex project. A stub is a dummy function that's used in place of an actual function. Why would we need that? Well, maybe we haven't written all our functions yet, but we need to have something there so that we can test out other parts of our program. So stubs and drivers, they can be very useful to help us troubleshoot our program. Stubs can help us test other parts of our functions and other parts of our programs to help us ensure everything's working. Similarly, a driver is a function that tests another function by calling it. And we'll actually experiment with some drivers in our assignments for this class. And so basically the purpose of a driver is to verify that a function is working so that you can confidently put it in your actual program. So another really good way to write and test programs is to write drivers. First, make sure all your functions are working and then implement the functions in your actual program. Let's look at a quick example. Here's an example of a stub. Suppose I was writing this program here and I wanted to write a function process grade file. But maybe process grade file was not ready yet. Maybe I still wanted to test and debug some other parts of this program. Here is an example of what process grade files stub could look like. This is not the actual function that would be performing calculations as required, but we have enough code written here that we can verify that the process grade file had been called with some arguments. And we have some code in here to verify that our input and output files were properly opened 
and red. So this is not the complete program, but this dummy function or stub can be used to help us test and debug as we're writing our actual program. So if you're developing a program incrementally, you might find it helpful to write stubs like this to verify each piece of your program works before moving on to the next part. Let's also look at an example of a driver. This example might be similar to one you'd see in our assignments. And so in this case, we see that this is a shape analyzer function test program. And so in this case, the program's purpose is purely for testing out functions. And so as we said, a, a driver is a function that tests another function by calling it. And so here we see in this sample, we're testing different functions in our program. So here we have an expected result and we call the function that we're interested in. And notice we have an if statement. If our function's result matches the expected result, then we inform ourselves that we passed. Otherwise, we write that we did not pass. And we can repeat this type of program with other functions that we may need in our assignments or in our other programs. Notice here we have another test for calc rect area, a function that would calculate a rectangle's area. And notice we can also see whether or not the expected result matched the actual. So driver functions can be incredibly useful for testing functions before implementing them in the real program that we're trying to write. And over the course of this semester, you may have opportunities to use driver programs as part of our assignments. Finally, our last topic about functions and debugging is this thing called default arguments. I'm including this more as an FYI because I will not expect you to know about default arguments for exams. However, they are useful to know about if you're trying to debug or write a program incrementally. What a default argument is, is it's an argument that's passed automatically to a function if that argument is missing in the function call. So for example, we would just put in this case, we're just saying, okay, if I don't give this function get value a number, by default, assign that argument the number zero. And you don't have to give every argument a default argument. If you have a function that takes multiple arguments, you could just give a default for some of them. Notice that you would just put the default argument in the function's declaration. So once again, these are very useful if you're trying to test and debug a function and you need it to have some value in there in order to actually test out your program. I'm not going to expect you to use default arguments for the purpose of this class, but keep this in mind in case it's helpful for you as you're testing and debugging your functions. All right, so we've covered a lot of information about functions. Let's go ahead and end with an example or demo of how we can use functions to streamline a program. And in this example, we're given some initial code. So notice we are given declarations for each of these functions 
with our preconditions and postconditions. So we know that get data files will basically update the input and output file names back in main. We have a function called calc letter grade that will take a homework, midterm, and final score and give us a character letter grade corresponding to the percentage of total points and the letter grade earned. And then we also have a function called process grade file. And this function will take the name of an input file and the name of an output file. And that process grade file function will read data from an input file like this one And we see we have the last name of a student and a homework, midterm, and final score. So for each student, we will read homework, midterm, and final scores. And in the output file, we will output the student's last name and their letter grade. So the idea is that instead of putting code in our main function, our task for this demo is to write the function definitions so that this main function will run. So we need to write a function definition for get data files, calc letter grade, and process grade file. Once we've written these function definitions, then we can run our main function and verify whether we are able to produce the output file shown. So I would encourage you to follow along in our sample code as we complete this example. Let's go ahead and open up CLion and give this a try. All right, so here we are in CLion, and notice we have the exact code that we had in the presentation. We've got our three function declarations and our main function. Our task is to add the function definitions so that we can complete this program. Let's go ahead and start with our first function, get data files. So we have the declaration, so we know that our definition must have a similar format. For my own reference, while I'm coding this up, I'm going to just copy paste the function declaration because I know that my definition needs to have the same exact name, return type, and arguments. Then to write my definition, notice I can delete my semicolon and I can put the code inside the curly braces for get data files. So here, the purpose of get data files is I need to prompt my user for the name of my input and output files. This function will use pass by reference to update input file name and output file name with the values that I obtain. So here, I just need to prompt my user for the name of the input file that I want to read. And then notice when I use cin, this value that I read for my cin statement, that's going to be copied into my input variable in my argument. And this value will be stored in input file name. Similarly, I need to ask my user for the name of the output file where I want to write the results. And here, once again, notice I am 
taking the user's input from the keyboard, I'm storing it in my variable output because this is my reference variable that will be updating output file name in my main function. All right, so next let's write our function definition for calc letter grade. So I'm gonna use a similar approach. So I'll delete my semicolon and notice for my function definition, I use the exact same return type, name, and number of arguments. And I put the code that calc letter grade needs to run inside the curly braces. Once again, I'm going to refer to my precondition and postcondition to help me as I write this function definition. I'm told that homework, midterm, and final are all going to hold assignment scores ranging from 0 to 200. And this function needs to return a character corresponding to the letter grade a student receives. So if I receive more than 89.5% of the points, I get an A. Otherwise, I get a B, C, D, or F based on my percentage of points earned. So let's go ahead and perform a calculation in order to help us determine what letter grade we receive. I'm going to declare a double called percentage score, which is my percentage out of the total points possible. In this case, I know that my percentage score will be equal to my homework score. My percentage score will be equal to my homework plus midterm plus final score divided by 600 points possible. And then, of course, I'm just going to multiply this by 100 to get a percentage. So now I know what percentage of the total points I got. Now I need to use some if statements to help me determine which grade I'm going to get. So in this case, I can say, well, if my percentage score is greater than or equal to 89.5, then I get an A grade. And so in order to get an A grade, well, I can just return the character A. Remember, this function should return a character corresponding to the letter grade. So if I get an A, I can just return that A. Then if I'm greater than or equal to 79.5, I get a B grade. and so on. So notice, depending on my percentage score, I get a different result. So my percentage is greater than 69.5, then I get a C. And notice here I'm using else if, and that way the combination of else if with that return statement, this ensures that only one of these if statements is going to be triggering. Finally, if I'm above 59.5, I get a D. And else, if none of those other ones are true, then I return an F. You do a little indentation fix with Control-Alt-L. And you see this function is now complete. So I'm able to determine my percentage score based on a homework, midterm, and final exam given in the argument. And depending on what percentage of the total points I got out of 600, I will return the corresponding letter grade. Our last function is called process grade file. And remember, this process grade file function is the one that should be processing the input file given to us. 
here we have this input file called studenttestscores.txt. And we want to go through this file, read the student name and their three scores, and calculate the final letter grade. We then want to produce an output file that has the student's last name and the letter grade, one per line, separated by a tab. So our output from the process grade file should be just a data file containing the student last name and the letter grade separated by a tab. So let's go ahead and write the code that we need for process grade file. So once again, I'm going to take my function declaration and use the same header for my definition, just without that semicolon. And inside the curly braces, I can put all the code that I need for process grade file to run. So in order to process my grade file, I'm going to need to declare some other variables. I know I'm going to have the name of an input and output file, but I'm also going to need some variables to hold a student's name and a homework, midterm, and final exam score. So in this case, let's go ahead and declare some variables. So I'll have a variable for the student's last name. I can have some doubles for homework. I've got variables for my homework midterm and final score. And I can also declare other variables as needed for this program. Notice I also need to actually process the data files. So I'm going to need to make sure I have include fstream and my calc letter grade function. So I have declared the include fstream header already. So let's go ahead and create or declare my input and output file stream objects, and I'm just going to name them in file and out file. And I can follow the same procedure that we learned in our file manipulation video. So if you're rusty on data files, you can also check out our file manipulation video for more information. Notice I'm already given the names of my input and output files in my process grade file function. So I can directly take these names that I've been given and open them. So I can use the open function to open my input file from my function argument. And I can also open output file from my function argument. So that way, I have successfully opened these two files so I can read and write data. I can also check to make sure that my file opened properly. So I can use if in file.fail to check for errors opening the input file. And if I was unable to open my input file, I can go ahead and say error opening the input file. And then I could, for example, I could exit the program with error code zero. So you can use this exit function to immediately end the program since I didn't have a valid file to open.
let's assume that our data files have opened successfully. You'll notice that my test score file has this header. I have name, homework, midterm, final. I don't want to read and process that first line from my file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the first four values from my file to get rid of that header. I want to get rid of that header. So I'm just going to declare a dummy variable. And I'm just going to read. Basically here what I'm doing is I'm going to read the first four values from the file to this dummy string variable to skip over them. Because I don't care about that header. I just want to analyze the data that comes after. Now I'm ready to actually read the data from my file using a, using a loop. And in this case, I'm going to use a while loop and notice I can set up my while loop like this. So I can set up a while loop so that as long as I have another row of data to read, so I'm going to read last name, homework score, midterm score, final score, read last name, homework score, midterm score, final score, so I read this whole line of data and as long as I'm able to read a full line of data from that file, my while loop will continue to run. So as long as I can read these four values, that loop will continue. It's also convenient because this while statement will conveniently read the next four values and store them in these variables. So once I have read last name, homework score, midterm score, final score, then it's time to calculate the student's letter grade. And I could go through and rewrite all that code, but notice I already have my function calc letter grade. So I can use calc letter grade and then of course I want to output the letter the last name and the students letter grade to the output file so in this case I can just write out file and then I have last name that's my students last name have a tab, and then here I want to use calc letter grade, and inside calc letter grade I can plug in homework score, midterm score, final score. So notice I don't need to write a ton of extra code here. Since I've already written this calc letter grade function, I know that I can directly write my student's last name and then their letter grade just with this one line of code here. And notice this program will repeat for each line of data in my data file. So each student's name will be read, their homework midterm final score will be read and plugged into calc letter grade to determine their letter grade. And notice I'm writing the last name and letter grade to the data file separated by a tab. And then I have a end line at the end 
So each output starts on a new line. So once I'm done reading my data, then all I need to do is close my files and I'm all finished. Just to help myself debug, I can also put some output statements here. Notice, for example, I can put a statement to inform the user that I'm processing the input data file. And then I can say, when I've closed my files, I can even have a message, data has been written to the output file. Oops, and that would be output file. Data has been written to my output file. So there you have it. Notice rather than writing all this code in my main function, I wrote my code in the function process grade file. That way when I go back to main and if I want to process some input file, I just call process grade file and that function will be performed. Let's go ahead and run this example and see what happens. So we are prompted, enter the name of the input file we want to read. Here our input file is named studenttestscores.txt, so let's go ahead and give it that name. And then we're asked name of the output file, let's call it results. And notice our program has run, we have processed the input file and written to the output file. So if we check results.txt, notice we have the student's last name, a tab, and then their letter grade. You can see that we have successfully completed the program. So I highly recommend that you go back through this example yourself and verify that you're able to reproduce this result. This is really great practice to get comfortable with functions. So let's go ahead and wrap up for today's video. Hopefully now you should be more comfortable with declaring, defining, and calling functions in C++. Please also be sure to follow those best practices we covered and be sure to remember the differences between local and global variables. For our class, you should be only using local variables in your functions. Also, please make sure you remember how and when to use overloaded functions and pass by reference. Once again, please do make sure you take the time to practice writing programs using functions. The more you practice coding and debugging programs with functions, the easier it will become. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions on this, and we'll see you in the next video.